you. Um, we're excited to be with you this evening and hear a little bit more about the GTM Research Reserve and one of our wonderful habitats there at the reserve. Um, as a side note, I recognized a couple names in here this evening, um, not through native plants, but um, through invasive plants. So I'm also the co-chair with Jessica Spencer um, of the First Coast Invasive Working Group. So most of the time I, I spend a good chunk of my time uh, battling invasive species. Um, so it's great to dabble in the natives. I appreciate all of the work that you all do with the Florida Native Plant Society. Um, so keep going. You guys work from your side. We'll work from the invasive side um, and meet in the middle. So I am going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for the great introduction. Make sure I can see the slides. All right. Um, so. The GTM Research Reserve, um, the full name is the Guanatalamato Matanzas National Estuarine Research Reserve. We are located in St. John's and Flagler counties. Um, our boundaries expand about 76,000 acres of land in those counties um, from the Palm Valley uh, Road all the way down to Palm Coast. And it, I say 76,000 acres, but we are only a staff of about 30 at the GTM Research Reserve. Um, and so we rely heavily on a lot of other land managing partners. So within our boundaries, we have the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Area. Um, they have the Guana River Wildlife Management Area. There are also several aquatic preserves, um, the National Park Service, the St. John's River Water Management District, Flagler County, the, National, the Florida Forest Service and Florida State Parks. Um, so we rely heavily on those partners to help us manage that land. Um, and then in our boundaries, we manage our peninsula and um, our dune system. So it's probably, and Candace, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's probably around like six to 7,000 acres that we directly manage. So I was told it was actually a little bit less than that. We're like oh. four thousand. I know I always tell everyone six thousand, but I think it's actually more like three or four thousand. So. so we only directly manage about four thousand of those acres, um, and within our boundaries, we have about forty miles of coast coastal lands, um, a ton of different species, threatened, endangered, native, invasive, um, plant and animal species. Is, and we have 61 archaeological sites um, within our boundaries that we're, we're managing. Um, so our name, I like to break it down, what's in a name. So the Guana, the Talamato, and the Matanzas are three rivers within our boundaries. Um, the Guana River is the, the river on the right side of your screen there. Um, we have a Guana Lake the Guana Dam and the Guana River, which hopefully you'll be able to see when you come out on December 4th. Um, and then the Talamato River is also known as the Intracoastal Waterway. That is a good portion uh, of our boundaries. And then in the more southern portion of our boundaries is the Matanzas River. So if you've ever gone to Washington Oaks and Garden State Park, that's within our boundaries. Um, and that's near the Matanzas River. So is Fort Matanzas. Just give you a little bit of scope of where all we're, uh, we're looking at. The next part of our name is the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. Um, so we are one of 29 National Estuarine Research Reserves across the country. Here in the state of Florida, we are fortunate to have three, um, which also have wonderful lands for you to explore. So um, if you go traveling, be sure to check out the Apalachicola NUR in the Gulf Coast, and then the Apple or the Rookery Bay NUR down in Naples, Florida. Um, but the system was, uh, you know, put into place in 1972 uh, through an act of Congress in the Coastal Zone Management Act. And throughout all of the reserves, we are protecting about 1.3 million acres of coastal ecosystems, which is pretty significant. Um, and we are in the process, well, not the GTM, but the reserve system overall is in the process of getting a reserve in Connecticut and hopefully Louisiana. And there is a rumor that there might be another one in Florida, um, but they haven't really started that process yet. 
every national estuarine research reserve has a federal partner and a state partner. Um, everyone's federal partner is NOAA or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and so we get a portion of our funding through them. And then each state has its own state partner. So here in the state of Florida, our partner is the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And we fall within the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. Um, so we have a great opportunity to look at research and resiliency and our natural ecosystems that are here um, and making sure that we can use science to really guide some management making decisions. And my favorite part of our name is the Research Reserve. Uh, we have a lot of exciting research and monitoring projects that are led by our staff, but also by visiting investigators, citizen scientists, um, other non-governmental organizations, and our students too. So we consider the reserve a living laboratory. Um, and as long as you have a question and a passion and you can help us address any of our management needs, uh, we invite you to come and collect data at the reserve. Uh, and we utilize that data from our research and our resource management and our stewardship teams to educate and connect with the community. Um, we have K through grade programming. So um, in the middle photo, you see some of our summer campers out in the field. We like everyone to get dirty at the reserve or wet in some way or fashion. Um, and so we get folks out in the field and we let them uh, do the things that our researchers do. They can go staining, they can collect water quality data. Um, there are several programs that it at the reserve that are led by citizen scientists and volunteers, and we couldn't do it without them. Um, so we appreciate everything, and you know we're excited to show you the reserve when you come out in December. Before we get into our dunes, I do want to just quickly share the mission of the reserve. Um, so I mentioned we we're part of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, but we are the non-permitting side. We get to do the fun stuff. Um, and so our mission is on the screen and it's really to make sure that we are using um, science-based research and monitoring to drive our education and management making decisions. We do not take a stand on one thing or another. We let the science and the data do the talking. Um, and so you'll hopefully see that through a lot of the presentation and when you come out to the reserve, some of our programming there. So this is our beautiful dune that we have at the GTM Research Reserve. Um, this, I believe, is one of our northern beach dunes. And you can see it's really tall. Our dune systems are sandy. Um, we have a nice four dune whale and um, secondary dune system. Our dunes are very fragile. So when you do come out to the reserve, we're not gonna be walking through the dune system. Um, we wanna make sure that we are protecting that dune. And we also don't want others to think that they can just come on into the dune and uh, take photos or uh, pull anything out of the dune. Some of our dunes in the GTM Research Reserve are the highest dunes along the East Coast. I believe that our dunes measure at 40 feet, which is pretty significant. And they are undisturbed dune systems, I mean, with, other than the, the boardwalks that you see in this photo. Um, but there are no houses within the stretch of this um, dune system, which is really exciting so we can see this natural habitat without much human disturbance. This is actually the site that we're hoping to take everyone to when you all come out to the reserve so you can see how high these dunes are. And those dunes, I'll go back a little bit, those dunes, um, because they are the natural dune system, provide a lot of ecosystem services to us as well as the wildlife that um, utilizes it as a habitat. Um, we are fortunate that it hasn't had to be restored and that we haven't really had to do any plantings here. This is all natural, um, which really paid off when we had Hurricanes Matthew and Hurricane Irma. Um, and you can see 
see here in this photo that our boardwalks did see some damage and I'll let Candace talk a little bit about that damage. Um, but the dunes did what they were supposed to do and uh, we received you know, minimal flooding on along the road along A1A because those dunes provide that nice buffer for us. So Candace, I don't know if you wanna talk about what kind of damage our dune and dune structures saw during those storms? Yeah, um, so yeah, that kind of, that the main thing really is, is just our, some of our boardwalks got, got a little destroyed as you can see in those two pictures there on the left. Um, it, the one boardwalk just kind of just got picked up and almost twisted around. It was a little crazy there, but, um, but that was really just the main damage was, was you know, our man-made structures, like Caitlin was saying, the dunes themselves, they, they were fine. Um, a lot of the vegetation did get uh, washed away, um, but the main dune itself was still there. Um, it did take a few years, you know, for, for everything to sort of grow back. Um, and I'm looking at them now, you, you really couldn't tell there was any damage to them. So, I mean, they, they came back pretty quickly. Um, and like the one, what you, know, you can see in the two pictures on, on the right there, is, that's our um, south uh, beach access boardwalk. And uh, we kind of had to do a little bit of, of rearranging of the boardwalk um, after the storm. Um, we had to kind of move, move it back a little bit and uh, make kind of a different entrance to the beach. But, uh, but really, I mean, it's, it's the damage to the dunes themselves was minimal. Um, and again, I just, I remember just kind of driving along A1A and it was just, um, where all that you know houses are everywhere it's just there's some blowouts in, in the dune areas there's sand all over the road but i mean our as soon as you hit our natural stretch of dunes that that whole area was just the whole road was protected because they had that huge dune system right in front of it so yeah it's pretty, pretty in interesting <laughs> time to work there um yeah, absolutely. And I think that's an exciting story to tell about the success of natural dune systems um, and to show the ones that are left do need to be protected. Um, and so our dunes are habitats for a lot of native species. Um, so we have just a couple of slides, but there are plenty more native species that we'll be able to um, showcase when you come out to the reserve. But we do have sea oats. Um, that is the dominant native plant species along our dune system. Um, and I'll show you a photo at the end of the slide when we actually help plant some sea oats. Um, after Hurricane Irma. Um, we do have prickly pear cactus throughout the dune system, which provides food for our native gopher tortoises that Candace will talk about in a little bit. Um, and then we do have a lot of dune sunflower and it's gorgeous to look out on the dune and see all of the different colors that are there. We do have standing cypress in our dune system. So I've kind of tried to highlight that in the red box on your screen. Um, and it comes in thick fields, I guess would be the best way to say it, um, but thick patches of it. Um, and we do have coral bean, not just in the dune system and along the roadways, but along our trails. So if you do come out to the reserve and go hiking on our trails, hopefully you'll see some coral bean out there. Some additional native plants that we have in our dune system, we do have blanket flower and horseman or bee balm, and then the crotons, which um, provide a little bit more of a leafier green. And then uh, similar to uh, a lot of other beaches um, here in Northeast Florida, we do have railroad vine. Um, I included stinging nettle in there as a be sure to watch out for it. Um, and then the passion flower. And hopefully, um, when you come out to the reserve, we can show you where there are patches of passion flower. Um, and when they're blooming, it's gorgeous and they're in our beach lot. So it adds a nice, um, a nice color before you even get out onto the beaches. And I hit on the native plants, which is great, but I know we also have some invasive plants. Uh, so I'll let Candace talk about those. 
Yeah, so um, it's kind of a lot of what, what our de my department does. Um, we mentioned earlier, I'm in the resource management uh, department and we are, uh, the park rangers are basically like the main portion of that and I oversee them. Um, and we do a lot of um, just invasive plant removal. Um, but we, our dunes are actually not too bad. Um, most of the, the invasives that we, we spend a lot of time working on is along our, in, in our trail system, like on the, the peninsula, we call it. Um, but in the dunes, uh, the main thing that we're actually working on right now is uh, Russian thistle. That seems to be kind of the worst. Uh, um, we've been just, just kind of plugging away, starting in the south and really just kind of walking north and just pulling up all, all that um, Russian thistle that we have out there. Uh, we're almost almost finished making it to, up all the way to the northern portion. Um, our, our managed dune area um, is about uh, a stretch of about four and a half miles or so. Um, and other plants that we are kind of on a lookout for that definitely could potentially be in our area or in our dunes. Um, we have the torpedo grass. Um, we have um, possibly uh, Kalankoe, which we, we, again, we haven't seen any in our dunes, but it's, it's definitely around in the area. So it could be there, something just we're on, on the lookout for. Um, Beach Vitex has been in our dunes in the past, and I think I, I have gotten a report recently that there is some more there now, um, so we need to go up and, and investigate, and that's going to be in our kind of our northern portion of, of the dunes, so I need to, to go check that out and see if the, the Beach Vitex came back, so that's going to have to be, uh, be removed. Um, but, um, and I, I was actually talking to one of our rangers the other day, asking him if he knew, if he can think of any others. Um, and he mentioned that we do have um, lantana as well. Um, the, um, but it's mostly uh, going to be on the opposite side of the dune, like along the roadway, like along A1A. Um, so that's, we do definitely have some of that there. Um, but so I kind of consider that part of the dune system. So, um, so those are, those are kind of like the main uh, invasives that we have. But yeah, like I said, it's not, we don't really spend a whole lot of time out there because it's not really too bad with invasives. So um, yeah, that's, I don't know, Caitlin, if you have anything to add to that, because you, <laughs> you know invasives too, <laughs> pretty well. Uh, <laughs> we, I know that in the Ponte Vedra area, which is where our Northern office is located and our beaches are located, um, beach vitex is something that is, has been found in the area. They're isolated populations. Um, so we're able to manage them. Um, Kalinkoe, our mother of millions, um, as some might know it, um, is in the surrounding area in a pretty strong population. And so, you know, we are closely connected with the St. John's County Parks and Recreation Naturalists and keeping an eye on that. Um, so hopefully it doesn't pop up within the reserve boundaries. Um, but yeah, I think Candace's team is doing a great job keeping an eye. Um, so we kind of hit on the plants within the reserve boundaries on the dunes. Um, we have a ton of species that are also on the trails, um, but that is a whole nother talk. <laughs> um, but hopefully if you come out to the reserve and you hit the trails, you'll see some of those. Um, so we are going to talk a little bit about the wildlife in the reserve that relies on that dune system. Um, and the first is the Anastasia Island beach mouse. Um, this is a species that um, was endangered and well, still, you know, it's not um, a species that we see. Um, back in the early 90s, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service actually tried to restart the population of the Anastasia Island beach mouse at the reserve. Um, because really, the, uh, the reserve and Anastasia Island were really the, the only places that this beach mouse had been observed. And so they really started to kickstart that population. Um, they did some monitoring after that reintroduction period. Um, but then priorities obviously shift. And when you're in a state agency, um, you know, the priorities change regularly. And so um, 
I don't believe that a lot of data had been collected after that until I think recently. I, Candace, I think you mentioned uh, a student that was coming out to resurvey the population. Yeah, I believe. Um, I think it was an intern, or um, they worked for for a FWC. Um, they were coming out to our dunes and put um, some traps out there uh, to try to to locate the beach mice. Um, on our property, but I, <laughs> I wasn't really a part of that. And I just, I kind of know it was like happening, but, and I'm not really sure what, what came of that <laughs> either, but, uh, but yeah, I know they're trying to, to restart the, the beach mouse studies at least. Yeah. And I know those studies, um, I, they, I believe that they also take place. I mentioned Anastasia State Park, but also Fort Matanzas National Monument. So hopefully we'll have some more information about this endangered species on our beaches. Yeah, so nesting shorebirds, um, another thing that, that we do at the reserve. Um, we uh, do monthly, uh, once a month, we send the rangers and some volunteers out just to drive up our, our whole stretch of beach and um, count you know, the look for nesting shorebirds really. We don't really have uh, huge colonies of birds on our, our beach. And um, since we kind of just really are getting into doing these, you know, surveys, uh, we did find some some nesting killdeer this year. Uh, so that was a little bit exci exciting for us because you know, it's kind of something we're, we're trying to, to get more into, I guess I should say. Um, so in the, in the summer months, um, we uh, do the uh, like looking or like our, we are looking for the nesting shorebirds and we'll um, enter all of our data into the Fish and Wildlife's uh, Florida nesting shorebird database. Um, but then we kind of decided it's, it's something, you know, just shorebirds in general or something to, to know what, what we have in our beaches and in the dune, dune system. So we decided to continue that and do monthly um, surveys just for what looking for the different species of shorebirds that we have um, in that area too. So it's uh, um, kind of just what we do with the shorebirds. Um, and the, like I said, we have some the killdeer. Really, like I said, the only thing that we've we've seen nesting. The, the one in the picture on the right there is actually um, a killdeer that was nesting in our uh, beach parking lot. So that does happen uh, on occasion too. We've had that probably. A, I think of at least three three different killdeer that we had nesting in the beach parking lots uh, this past year too, but but we were a little excited to see them on the beach. <laughs> so, yeah. Interesting that they choose the beach parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> Cars driving by and you know, have people everywhere, but uh, we just put up a little uh, little barrier around them and, and let them be. <laughs> Um, so sea turtles are another another thing we monitor on the beach, and, and they do kind of go up into the the, the dunes sometime and nest. So I guess we can <laughs> talk about them in this this presentation here. But uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. We have um, three main species that that nest here on our beach. Uh, the the most prevalent so the loggerheads, um, but we do also have uh, green sea turtles and leatherbacks that will nest here. Um, that's uh, one program that. I uh, kind of mentioned earlier, we kind of, we rely a lot on our volunteers and the sea turtle uh, program is, is a basically a volunteer run program. Um, we wouldn't be able to do it if we didn't have any volunteers um, with our you know small staff that we have. Um, the rangers kind of fill in and help here and there, but we, we didn't have, we won't, don't have the time to do it ourselves, but it's really um, interesting and important data to be collecting. Um, just this season alone, we had um, 251 nests. Um, 14 of those were green. Um, three of them were leatherbacks, and we said the rest were all loggerheads. 234 loggerheads. Um, we actually had a really late nester this year. It's kind of fully nested. A uh, green sea turtle nested on September 27th, which is it was surprising <laughs> for us. It's, a, it's kind of a late nest, um, and. I believe one of the, it, it's still out there now. Um, we could potentially have Thanksgiving uh, baby sea turtles, but um, it could take even longer than that, who knows? <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I believe it's one of one of the last nests on the St. John's County beaches right now. So uh, kind of cool. We have to you know, monitor that. This is the sea, sea turtle nesting season just officially ended on, on October 31st. So um, we still kind of have to go out there and check on that nest every once in a while. We're looking for things like predation and looking for signs that the nest has hatched. And um, what we do is like we have our, our volunteers to you know, like go out and, and check for nests, they mark the nests. And then after a nest hatch, uh, they evaluate the nest. So they'll dig into it and count all the hatched egg shells and um, shell, um, eggs that haven't hatched, like just that. Um, and some, some that were, sometimes you find live sea turtles and little babies in the nest. And, so we kind of collect all that data um, and put that into a, a database called seaturtle.org. And we also submit all the data to uh, FWC as well every year. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a sea turtle program. <laughs> but um, moving a little bit more into the dunes, you can say we have a, we definitely have a lot of gopher tortoises out there. Um, we've been doing, uh, gopher tortoise uh, monitoring for a while now. We try to aim at doing a um, a burrow survey at least every three years. Um, it's, it's uh, let's see, when, when would we do them? Um, 2014 and 15, we did one, um, 2016, 2019. We kind of separated a little bit because we do a, a survey on our dune system. Um, like I said, that's a, a four and a half mile stretch of beach. So it's it's pretty involved. Again, we use a lot of volunteers for that. Um, and we also do one on our peninsula as well. Um, so we kind of separate these, these uh, surveys. Um, but yeah, the, the ones on our dunes uh, is pretty interesting. Um, they, it's, there's pictures, I don't know if you can see them real well. They're, they're kind of uh, small, but the picture on the left, um, is, is going from the north to the south. Um, so you can see that there are just a ton of, of burrows up in the northern part portion of our dunes. And as it goes a little bit farther south, it, it gets pretty sparse. Um, so it just, it is kind of an interesting thing that we're, we're monitoring and it appears to be that maybe, maybe a few more tortoises are, are moving farther south. Um, than they have in the past. So we're just kind of monitoring those, those burrows. And what we do is um, we'll actually kind of just line up along the dune system. And you can see that picture on the right. I took of, you know, one person's kind of at the top, one's at the bottom, and there's you know, just a few people kind of throughout the middle and you just, just walk and basically you're doing like a transect lines and um, just looking for burrows and get record the GPS coordinates. We're determining if the burrows are, um, active, inactive, or abandoned. And um, they have just kind of a protocol for determining, you know, what that is. So they mark that as well, um, just to keep track of. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just something, you know, with the lasted one, yeah, 2019. So potentially next year, we should be doing another one. <laughs> um, and uh, another really cool thing is um, we have a, a Flagler College uh, has a, a capstone uh, project. Their students do this a big you know, project every year. And we have a group of students right now uh, this year that are studying gopher tortoise um, uh, like parasites and their, um, like ticks and things like that, that that live on the, you know, feed off of the gopher tortoises. And they're comparing um, the tortoises in our dune system to the tortoises on our peninsula. And some this is an interesting thing that they've been finding is every uh, tortoise that they've found in the dunes, every one of them has had ticks on them. Um, some of them are just, just loaded down with ticks, some have tons. And not a single one that they've caught in the, uh, um, on our peninsula and our trail system, had, none of them have had, had any ticks at all. So uh, it's kind of a really interesting study to I'm kind of excited to see you know the more the uh, the results of that but yeah so there's there's that's uh like what we we're talking about the having other groups you know uh, scientists come in and, and do studies here on the reserve as well so that's just what uh one group at Flagler's Flagler College is doing 
Um, so, yeah. And um, this, uh, the HERP monitoring, or physiological monitoring, this is what we're, um, we're kind of doing this ourselves, our, our ranger team. Um, we, ha we have a kind of a new group of rangers this past year, and we are trying to, um, instead of just being the typical park ranger, you know, that goes out and cleans the bathrooms and takes out trash and everything, we, we were trying to actually incorporate a little bit more science because we are the research reserve. So, you know, we should be doing, <laughs> we should all be doing science, I believe. Um, so we have a really uh, neat group of rangers this, this, uh, um, this, like I said, this past year that have really been wanting to do more, um, more science, more like monitoring projects. So our, our lead ranger, uh, his name is Zach, has, has set up this, um, this HERP study. And um, mostly what it's, it's focused on the peninsula. Um, we, we do, it's just kind of broken down into three components. Um, one is dip netting um, in our freshwater ponds. Uh, another is we set up PVC pipe traps uh, for tree frogs. And another is a drift fence trap. Um, we do have, uh, and we try to put these, these drift, drift fences and these dip netting sites into, in different, like kind of different communities. So one of them is, is our dune system that we're, we're um, trying to, to uh, the, the whole main goal really is to get just an idea of the, all the different species. I'm just trying to capture all the, all the uh, a snapshot of, you know, what, what different species we have here in the reserve. Um, and thanks, Caitlin, there we go. <laughs> that's uh, so far, that's what we have. So with the drift fences, and you can see in the picture and what it is, it's this big, uh, it's like a tarp material kind of divided into like these three little arms that come out. And um, what, what's not in the picture are these little wire mesh uh, traps. So they put those traps um, kind of like a cone shape, like along the sides of that drift fence. So the idea is a, a snake or a, a frog or you know any kind of you know uh, animal there is going to hit, you'll be walking along, run into that drift fence, and then start walking along the side of the fence, and then eventually end up in one of the traps. We put. Um, I think 12 traps total along each side of those those arms. Um, so four four along each side there. And um, we do that uh, for 15 days in a row and every season. So we're gonna hit you know fall, summer, spring, winter. Um, and so far we've only been doing this for a year. So we don't have you know much. So you can see we have. 11 species that we've we've caught so far in these uh, uh, drift fence traps uh, in the dune. This is just in a dune system. So, um, but yeah, that's our um, herb monitoring. And yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's that. Um, prescribed burns, uh, another thing that, that we occasionally do in the dunes, um, this, Burn that you can see there is uh, the boardwalk is our middle beach access. We kind of burned from the, the middle beach all the way down to the southernmost uh, area of our managed lands. And we did that in 2014, I believe. And I mean, the, uh, yeah, 2014. So <laughs> the dunes, they don't really need to be burned that often. Um, but it's uh, main main goal of, of burning um, for us is to reduce the fuel loads uh, in not just the dunes, but on all the different systems that, that we burn in um, the habitats. Uh, as you know, uh, Florida is, pro is the uh, lightning strike capital um, of the world. So we, uh, we get lots of lightning, we get a lot of natural uh, fires. And by doing prescribed burning, and lessening that fuel load, you're um, not not preventing wildfires, but definitely lessening the chance that um, that we would have a wildfire in our areas. So it's a good thing, but it's also um, I'm sure, as you know, a lot of native plants rely on fire. Um, so uh, you know, another reason to to do it just get some fire through that area, um, make it natural and controlled, and uh, you know, a lot of our native 
uh, plants will, will come back um, and just kind of making the system, the dune system overall is healthier. Um, we burn, I think, uh, doesn't need, like I said, doesn't need to be very often, like 20, 25 years or even longer um, is, is as much as we need to, to burn the dunes. Like we were talking about the hurricanes earlier um, and I mentioned that, that hurricane, you know, it was Matthew, I think it was that really just, I mean, it took almost all the vegetation away. Um, so it almost did kind of like what it, what it would look like after a burn. So we, you know, didn't, don't need to burn, you know, very often because of things like the hurricanes and, and, and all that, but um, yeah. So was, yeah, that's really some, there were some more pictures in there of the burn. It was, it was a really, really cool burn. <laughs> Just really interesting to see, see the dunes on fire and there's the, the beach right next to you but it, it was just it was it was kind of fun <laughs> too um yeah pass it back to caitlin if you have anything to add um, so hopefully we gave you just a little snapshot of of our dune ecosystem and what we find there uh what kind of research and monitoring and management um that our visiting investigators citizen scientists and staff at the reserve um, put into our dune system um, and so hopefully you know you'll join us on the field trip on december 4th um, if not I wanted to share a couple of ways that you can visit the reserve. Um, so the reserve, you know, it's protected landscape, but it is also for you all to enjoy. Um, so we do have a visitor center, a dam and beaches and trails. So here's just some quick information about each of those. Our visitor center, um, exhibit hall and everything within the exhibit hall is life size um, with exception I've been told to the North Atlantic right whale the adult that's hanging from the ceiling I've been told that in real life it's actually smaller but they had to scale that animal down just a bit to get it through the building um, but it has an estuary diorama in the center of the room where you can see all of the estuary plants and wildlife um, also the oceanic is hanging from the ceiling and then in one corner of our exhibit hall is our dune system so you can see um, a gopher tortoise, you can see an indigo snake, you can see nesting sea turtles and some of the, the vegetation along our dune system. As I mentioned, we also have a, a fishing dam, the Guana Dam, um, that is very popular for fishing, shrimping, crabbing. Um, we have two boat access points out of this Guana Dam. Um, one of them is tidal, one of them is not. So if you go out on the tidal river side, just keep an eye on the tide or you might not be able to come back in. Uh, and then we do have a trail system. So this trail system runs through the Guana Peninsula, which is the, the land that we do directly manage. Um, and whether you are there for a quick short walk or a longer walk, uh, we have options ranging from just a quarter mile loop to a six mile loop. Um, so there's plenty to go and explore and go through a couple of different habitats on the peninsula and see a lot of different different wildlife and plants. Uh, we have a lot of programming at the reserve that we encourage everyone to check out. Um, our website is www.gtmnerr.org. We do have a calendar of events and we are starting to get our programming back up and running. Um, so we have guided exploration hikes, family staining, beach exploration. Um, we also have summer camps. So children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, neighbors, um, encourage them to come to our summer camps. Uh, we have lecture series and special events all online. And if you don't have a paddle um, of your own, um, have a concessionaire um, at our Guana Dam called the Guana Outpost South, and they do have kayak and paddleboard rentals. Um, and I believe that they were talking about doing bike rentals. I'm not sure if they've gotten that up and running yet. Um, 
that you can come and no need to bring your own equipment. Um, just rent something from there and you can see the water that we have been seeing. Um, we've mentioned it a couple times, but we encourage anyone and everyone to come out to the reserve and get involved. Um, we rely heavily on volunteers in our citizen science, in our education programming, our um, Herpetological monitoring, our archaeological monitoring, our oyster monitoring, um, or getting out into the classrooms and working with students. Um, the bottom right hand photo um, is from a school where students were using virtual reality to explore the reserve. Um, we recognize that not everyone has the resources to come and visit the reserves themselves. And there are a lot of schools um, in Northeast Florida that you know are close to the beaches, but um, students have never been to the beach. And so we're trying to make sure that those students have the opportunities to either come out to the reserve by us paying for their buses, um, or bring the reserve to them. So if you're ever interested, if you have some free time and you wanna volunteer at the reserve, um, I say we kind of give the reserves the key to the building. Um, we let, if you're interested, we can get you trained and boat certified, ATV certified, um, driving our vehicles and running a lot of our programs that we have. So. Um, I encourage you to complete a volunteer application online, um, come to an orientation and get out to the reserve and explore some more. Um, and as promised, the photo at the end of the slide, um, after Hurricane Ma Irma, after Hurricane Irma, um, there was a section of beach adjacent from our visitor center at the Exxon gas station on A1A, if anyone's familiar with that location. Um, and it saw significant erosion. And the county wanted to, um, to help protect the road and the gas station. They wanted to bring in a lot of sand, but there wasn't a plan at that time to revegetate that sand. Um, so our uh, stewardship coordinator said well you know what let's jump in and let's plant some um, the oats and so we got together the staff um, and a lot of volunteers and we got a couple thousand sea oats um, and we planted this this dune system and I'll give this as a little teaser to your visit um, this is what it looked like uh, the day of planting, and if you come out to the reserve, I uh, will show you what it looked like today. Um, and it's a very successful and a great example of um, some native plantings in a dune restoration. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that way I can see if we have any questions. Cool, so Jenny Hinton has a question. What native dune plants do gopher tortoises eat? And do they do you find any patterns of association between certain types of plants and dense burrows? Um, yeah, they definitely love the prickly pear cactus. Um, probably the, one of their main sources of food. And I, I'm not really sure, I guess, I would guess that we probably have more of them up in our northern, you know, portion where we find more gopher tortoises. Um, the dunes, it, they're, the shape of that kind of changes a little bit. The southern portion um, where the, the burrows are less dense, um, it, it's really, really steep area. Um, but as you kind of get farther north, it's more, uh, just kind of a different shape. There's some, some more flat areas, some taller areas, but uh, uh, I don't know if maybe that um, that landscape kind of has anything to do with with the density as well, but there's probably probably definitely more um, um, food for them up there as well. Uh, do you all ever find any rattlesnakes out there? That was another. Yes. Question. Yeah. Yes, we do. Um, I've seen you know pygmy rattlesnakes. I've seen the diamondback rattlesnakes uh, in the dunes. Um, so they are definitely out there. Nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and are there any fire dependent plants in the dunes and do, do the burns reduce the invasive species? 
Um, I, I don't know exactly. What's fire? I don't know. Maybe Caitlin can help me out with this one. Um, what would be fire dependent? Um, as far as invasive species, I don't think it really does. I know some invasives that we we put fire through um, come back. Yeah quickly. So I think it just depends on, on what, what species it is. Um, Coding but, grass is notorious to come back after yeah, fire. Exactly. A, yeah. I don't yeah. think that, I know that there was some Kogan grass um, along some property adjacent to the reserve boundaries, but I don't think we've observed it within the reserve at this point. Yeah. Um, as far as, as far as fire dependent species, I'd have to go and look at our, our species. <laughs> list. We've got a couple of hundred out there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm sure the green is really used to just being disturbed by just the tides and hurricanes. Yeah. So I'm sure fire, you know, they like fire, I'd imagine, some type of disturbance. Yeah. Um, so are there any noticeable changes in the dune system as a result in uh, climate change in the recent decades? And are you all finding any mangroves? Uh, so as far as the dune system, um, you know, I think that the best way to call our dunes, um, or the best the best thing to uh, describe it is it's dynamic. Um, our research team does do beach profiling, um, and so there are a select number of points that they do profile on a regular basis, um, and we do see is they are seasonal changes um, but I wouldn't necessarily say that we've seen any noticeable drastic changes in the dunes in our in our natural dune system fortunately um, on the opposite side of the dunes so where the marshes are uh, we are seeing um, we are seeing some changes in our in our traditional salt marshes um, and we're starting to call them more coastal wetlands. Um, because, uh, Kate, we are seeing mangroves. Um, the GTM Research Reserve is right in that ecotone of uh, that transition between salt marshes to mangroves. And we have a lot of visiting researchers that are helping us really look into this question, um, what's happening to our marshes? Uh, how is sea level rise changing those habitats? Um, and how could mangroves help make our uh, our coastal wetlands a little bit more resilient. Um, so we have vegetation monitoring platforms um, throughout the reserve that are measuring uh, sediment elevation and uh, vegetation uh, surveys that are documenting the species uh, changes. And many of our marshes, uh, because we're because of the shape of the coastline, there are these marine terraces. And so they're kind of stair-stepped. Um, and so the marshes typically would be able to migrate uh, if you had a nice smooth slope, but because we have these terraces, the, the marsh vegetation will hit a terrace and they can't like jump up. So they're with sea level rise, they'll drown in that space. Um, or if it's not a terrace, it's built infrastructure um, where they were not allowing those species to migrate. And so we're working with the Smithsonian and Villanova University to document some of these changes in, within the sediment and within that vegetation. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about mangroves, I encourage you, um, and I'll send information to, to Adam and Kate, about our state of the reserve. It is a science symposium that's going to be hosted um, in February. And the project that Candace mentioned with the gopher tortoises and the ticks, uh, those students are going to be presenting at state of the reserve and we'll have several visitors, visiting researchers and staff presenting about mangroves. Cool, I guess we could, um, from what you were saying earlier, piggyback on another question about someone asked about, um, do you, can any quantitative dune plant surveys? I think you might have. In the marsh, we do. Yeah. Um, we do have specific points and platforms that um, our team regularly goes back to to monitor. But Candace, I'm not sure if you all do any in the dune. No, but that's another one of those projects that like we have kind of on the 
in our minds to, to do. And I think it's probably one of the next ones that we're going to, to start. Like I said, we're, our department is pretty new at doing stuff. And we, we, the resource management team mostly focuses on the uplands. So can kind of dunes are within that. Um, so we have our, our researchers that kind of focus on the, the marshes and, but our, our, our team wants to, once they get kind of that herp surveys and the gopher tortoise surveys and everything kind of well established, then they want to bring in another thing. And I think, I think they're going to try to get um, vegetation surveys uh, started. So, and that's going to be another, you know, different habitats. We'll do, um, you know, like pine flatwoods areas and, and hammock areas, and then probably a, a, a survey in the dunes as well. And I'm sure that uh, goes with a list of invasive plant species and pests as well. Mm -hmm. I figured that. <laughs> So two more questions about sea oats. Um, so how long were the sea oats planted? You might've might said that. They were uh, planted in May of 2018. Um, and they, you know, they've done great. And they were, as you saw in the picture, they were planted in nice rows. Um, and when you come out to the reserve, you'll see that they have flourished and um, a lot of other native plants have jumped into that empty space. Awesome. Um, and then, so where, where would someone, can you buy um, sea oats? Are they available in retail? Can you buy them somewhere? Yeah, I would have to look to see who we bought them from. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I can share that with you. Um, and other than that, you know, they're, they're tricky to get a hold of. Because <laughs> um, yeah. they are an endangered species, right? Aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So you cannot, you cannot go pull them out or, you know, you can't split them like, uh, any other plants or collect the seeds themselves. Um, they are protected. And Candace, do you know where they were purchased back in? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> All I know is Scott brought them in and landed them. <laughs> they were hard to get a hold of because yeah. I think a lot of people were doing dune restoration projects. Yeah. Um, but I can look into see where he purchased them from. But you'll also want to make sure, you know, take into consideration the genetics of, of the population that you're bringing in. Yeah. You want to find something that's a little bit more like yours. That's a great point too, because a lot of times, you know, in the native plant trade, we see a lot of Florida plants and they're not regionally native. And that's, that is very important to keep that genetic influence in that regional population. So good point. <laughs> um, does anyone else have any questions? Kate, did you want to mention Anything about how Ixia contributed to uh, the plants, their plant garden there? Well, yes. Um, next to the education center, which, by the way, is a wonderful place to visit if you've never been there. There's a lot to see. The estuary is beautiful. Sometimes you see manatees and dolphins. And then there is a native plant garden, which is set up, at, I believe it's a pollinator garden. And so one of the, um, I just, we ended up, I, I can't, honestly, I don't remember. I think it might have been leftovers from the plant cell, but we had a number of square stem and other plants that were basically extras. And so um, I met up with one of the volunteers, and so we gave them a number of plants that are now in their garden. So just spread in the native plant joy. <laughs> and well the other thing I, I, I put in the chat is a plug for the state of the reserve. It's open to the public and there, there's students there, undergraduates, graduate students, professors, people that are interested in coastal systems. So it's a mix of public and educators. And depending on the budget for the year, there may be a great food spread afterwards or perhaps a more uh, frugal food spread, but it's a, a great event. So if you can uh, attend, I, I strongly encourage it. It's free to attend. So it's a really interesting day. Yeah, thanks for that plug, Kate. Um, this year, we're doing it a little different. Um, so the podium or the oral presentations will be virtual. Um, so you can join from, from your own home. Um, but the poster presentations will be in person at Legacy Ale Works. Um, so the spread will be a little bit different, uh, but hopefully we can work out a good deal and get attendees at least a beer or two. Well, awesome. Well, um, I think that's it. But thanks so much for your wonderful presentation. And we're looking forward to the field trip.
uh, in December, December 4th. So um, cool. I guess we'll wrap it up. <laughs> How come I came on? Yes, thank you very much. Interesting presentation. And it'll be nice to get out, out on a field trip out to the beach. We haven't done that. Yeah, be, should be good weather for it. So. All right, cool. Well, thanks again, guys. Have everyone have a good night. <laughs> Bye.